We are beginning a new journey today, and it is in the Gospel of John. And over the next months, we're going to work, walk through. We're not going to touch on every story, every verse, but we're going to get a pretty good taste out of the 21 chapters of the Gospel according to John. Now, Gospel means good news, and there's a whole lot of good news in John's accounting of the life of Christ. The good news, the Gospel good news, is that Jesus... The sinless Son of God came to this earth, died on a cross to pay for our sins, placed in a tomb, raised from the dead on the third day, is alive forevermore, and offers to us relationship to God, eternal life, and the hope of heaven one day. And there's a whole lot of good in that kind of gospel. Now, what I want to do as we're kicking off a series on the Gospel of John today is I want to... I want to give you the kind of background you need if you're going to understand a book in the Bible. And so these are the kinds of things that if you were going to take a class uh, at one of our Baptist schools on the gospel according to John, well, there's certain things you're going to learn right on the front end. And so we're going to touch on those things. First of all, the author of the book. Who wrote the gospel of John? And if you buy a commentary on a book in the Bible... What you'll find is you'll find a lot of people arguing about things like that. Because if you're going to write a Ph.D. dissertation, you have to have a dissenting view from what everybody else has said about it. So, people write a lot of things about the Bible. Well, this John, the Gospel of John, is John the Apostle. John, one of the twelve. Uh, in, uh, in the Gospel of John, he doesn't name himself. Which is weird, because the other Gospels, he's a prominent guy. He's one of the core disciples. One of the there's three that are really close to Jesus all the time. and John's that guy. He doesn't name himself, but he does refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And, and that part always warms my heart. He's the, in his experience with Jesus, out of everything that Jesus did, he just knew Jesus loved him so very much. And that love of Christ uh, captured his heart. And when he thought of himself, he said, I'm just that guy that Jesus Jesus really, really loved. We know that he is a son of Zebedee. That's his dad. His mom is Salome. Here's the weird part about that. Salome is the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, which means that John and his brother James, another one of the 12 disciples, are first cousins to Jesus we, we know that they're referred to, Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder, because sometimes they were a little on the temperamental side, a little fiery, uh, a little edge to them, that uh, gradually was worked off as the Holy Spirit worked in their lives. We know this, that from the cross, Jesus spoke to John, because he entrusted to John the care of his mother Mary uh, after he died, uh, just before he died on the cross. Now, when was the Gospel of John written? If you, you look at these books in the Bible, there's, and you read a commentary on them, it's going to say, this book was written, and there's a date. Okay, how do you come up with those dates for when books are written? And it's important because how it fits into the flow of the story, how it fits into history. Well, often, there's just a little clue somewhere in a book of the Bible. And you find that clue, and you say, oh, there's, there's the key to knowing at least a time frame of when something happens, when this book is produced. And for John, one of the key places that we look is in chapter 5, verse 2. And it's telling the story. This is one of the miracles that Jesus performs. It says, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda having five porches. The key thing about that statement is it's all spoken in present tense, which seems to indicate that at the time John wrote this, it was still there. Now we know this, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. So we think John wrote later than the rest of Matthew, Mark, and Luke for sure. And so then you start piecing this together and saying, okay, he wrote after them, and we have some clues about when they wrote. We know that Jerusalem is destroyed and that this Bethesda is still there. So John wrote close to A.D. 70, not quite at A.D. 70. So we know that kind of thing. We know also he wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, little books toward the end of the New Testament. And we know that Christ revealed to him the revelation, the 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 last book in our New Testament. 
the, in the New Testament, there are four of these little books called Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you think about the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call those synoptic gospels. And synoptic means they're the same or they're similar. They have a lot in common. They, they approach the story in the same way. And John uh, does not. Matthew, he wrote to a Jewish audience uh, primarily. That's his target. While they're going to overlap with some of their stories, and all, he writes to a Jewish audience. You get Mark, he's writing to a Roman audience, a Roman mindset. Luke is writing to a Greek mindset. And then you get to John. And John, he's throwing a big wide net. Whosoever, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal everlasting life. And that's John's target. It's everyone else. The synoptic gospels give us a, a chronology of, of things. It runs in, in an order. In fact, uh, Luke in his gospel, he, he says, I'm writing this to give a, an accurate account of the events. I, I'm, I'm laying this out in a logical kind of way. So Luke, Luke throws that up front. I'm creating this. Well, you look at the gospel accounts, and I think they, they, had, they come in an order, and they draw a little bit from each other as far as an order and outline for, for the events and how they came to pass and how it all fits together. And then you get to John, and he is so different because he starts in the beginning. In the beginning just like Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And we'll talk about this next Sunday when we start with Genesis, with uh, John chapter 1. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, well, that's where John starts with his gospel. In the beginning. By the creative word of God. By the incarnate son of God. The world comes into being. And light and life come to the world. So John begins with a full statement in John chapter 1. The full deity of Christ. He is, uh, he is Lord, he is God, and it ends with Thomas. Because, and I'll talk about chapter 21 in a moment, but you finish up in chapter 20 with Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. And, and those brackets really frame the story of what he is communicating. And that is, Jesus is Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God. John is different from the others. The others, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they emphasize Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Now, they're all going to get to Jerusalem because of the story of the cross. But they don't spend a lot of time in Jerusalem. They're up in the north in Galilee around Jesus' home territory. When you get to John, he, he's going to touch on some things in Galilee, but his focus is overwhelmingly on the Jerusalem side of the story. In John, he records Jesus as saying in chapter 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Again, a declaration that he is God. And you get these seven I am statements that, that, that paint the picture uh, as Jesus is declaring in those I am statements. <laughs> Ultimately, I am God. In Seven miracles, seven signs. In John has organized this so carefully. Seven signs, seven representative miracles, all of which point to him as the Son of God. So there's a lot of differences between John and the other Gospels. John does not include a genealogy. He doesn't include a birth story about Jesus. He doesn't include anything about Jesus' temptation, about casting out demons, parables, transfiguration, uh, Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. This, the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane or uh, an ascension story. It's, uh, it's a lot different. In fact, 93% uh, of the material that you find in John's gospel does not appear in the other gospels. That makes him really, really unique in what he presents. John sought to lead his readers to eternal life by convincing them of a couple of things. That Jesus is God 
and that he performed miracles that demonstrated he was God. If God is going to walk on this earth, you'd expect certain things would be a mark of God, and miracles being one of those, you'd expect miracles to take place. So that's why he has the signs that are in there to confirm his deity. He is Lord, he is God, God in the flesh. John points to everything in his teaching as a sign about Jesus, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. The theme of the book, and this is simple, and we're going to see it from chapter 1 all the way to 21. The theme of the book, Jesus is God. Uh, very, very simple. Uh, he is not just a, we talked about this last Sunday on Easter. He's not just a man. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a moral example. He is God. And John is going to hammer that theme over and over and over again. He's 100% God, 100% man, that fully God, fully man, uh, the miracle of the incarnation, God becoming flesh, living among us. One of the interesting things about John's gospel is that when you read these books in the Bible, this is one of the big debates that you run into is, and why was this written? To what end? For what purpose was this book written? And most of them, they say, well, it seems like there's some false teaching that had arisen. Oh, there's some conflict going on in Corinth. Oh, they're, they're redefining Jesus back over here at this time. And so uh, in Colossians, Paul is going to jump into the middle of that argument. But John is never debated on this in the Gospel of John because John doesn't leave any shadow of doubt about the purpose of what he has written. And that takes us to chapter 20. Because if you're going to do a series in the Gospel of John, the best place to start is in the next to the last chapter, right? Okay. John chapter 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these things are written. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So what do you believe? Do you realize that what you believe is a matter of life and death? That, that what you believe is either moving you closer to life, or it's, it's breathing life into you, or it's taking the life out of you and leading, killing you, just leading you to death. I'm not going to elaborate on this just a whole lot, but I'm going to make a, a brief comment about it. Recent events. There's a guy, one of the most aggressive atheists uh, of our generation, who talked a lot about spiritual things, uh, Stephen Hawking. He died a couple of weeks ago after a long battle with ALS. And, uh, a brilliant man by all standards, a lot of uh, physics... Uh, discoveries and theories are tied to him. But here's, here's what Stephen Hawking did. Is Stephen Hawking said, I'm such a smart guy, and I know all this stuff. I'm going to talk about spiritual stuff too. And so he's going to, he says with great authority, so obviously there's no God because science has disproved that. Well, you know, yeah, like that's, Somebody like that. Out of everything there is to know about everything in the universe, how, what percentage would you say you know? Well, it'd be ridiculously boastful to say 1%. So Stephen Hawking, you know, out of every, that other 99%, you don't think there's a possibility God's out there? Because you certainly didn't disprove him in a laboratory. Suddenly your scientific method that you're so proud of, you're just making stuff up. You're throwing to see if something will stick to a wall. Before he died, he said, I'm not going to make any deathbed. He knew he was getting close. He said, I'm not going to make any deathbed confessions. Because this is what happens when you die. Your body stops functioning and you're just done. That's what happens. Well, he didn't prove that in a laboratory either. All of his scientific method, all of his, well, we know because of science. He just made something up. Everybody has a faith system. Everybody has things they believe. And what you believe is either breathing life into you or it's, shoot, it's pumping death in, into you. And, and the decisions that you make about what you're going to believe, they direct the course of your life, where it's going to go. And whether it's going to be well or it's going to be toward a lot of darkness. Uh, but so much of what we believe... does not bring us life in its name. Only Jesus does that. 
Now, faith is a powerful force inside of every one of us. Faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is what you believe. And the reality is, it is always going to take you somewhere. That's true for now, and that is true forever. Here's the amazing thing about God. He loves people like us who have our self-invented ideas about how the world works and what truth is and what truth is not. He loves us enough to, to break through, to, to come at us in spite of all that, to step past it, clear the path, and, and to give us the word of life through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to do that. He had to come himself. And he took on flesh and blood, and he walked this earth. He lived among us so we could see what it should look like. See, what is God like? We know what God is like. We know what God would do. We know what God would say in a variety of circumstances because we have seen Jesus, who is himself God. One of Jesus' closest friends, John the Apostle, someone he'd known his whole life, wrote this book. And he wants to connect us with the real Jesus, not the imaginary Jesus. There are a lot of imaginary Jesus uh, ideas out there. And we all know what Jesus is like, right? Well, let's see. He's, uh, he's about, you know, 6'2", six 6'3", six taller than most average people around him. He has golden blonde hair. He has sparkling blue eyes, uh, always a white robe and a blue sash, right? That's what Jesus looks like because that's certainly what a first century Jewish man would look like. We all have our imaginary Jesus. John says, I want you to know what Jesus was really like. I, I want you to know uh, who he really was. Not, not a made-up, imaginary Jesus, but the real Jesus. And just before those two verses I read a moment ago, as John summarized his purpose for the book, you get that whole story of Thomas. And Thomas... Doubting Thomas, he sees the risen Christ, my Lord and my God. And he saw and he believed and it put life into him that, that would carry him on to, to be a missionary and to lay down his life according to church tradition for the sake of the gospel. And then John adds that great note. And blessed are those who have not seen, who didn't have the advantage Thomas had, who have not seen and yet, have believed and that pulls all of us into the story and it's a part of who we are when we read John's gospel God shows us Jesus with this direct personal exposure that we might believe and that we might live to be fully alive there's a guy and I didn't even think about this until this morning Irenaeus now, I haven't mentioned Irenaeus ever in church until last week. So now he's the most popular church history guy you're going to hear about because it's two in a row on Irenaeus. So, ooh, the year of Irenaeus, 2018. Here's what we get. He was writing about 100 years after John wrote the gospel. So he's an early church leader. And he says, the glory of God is man fully alive. That you might have life, abundant life, full life, eternal life. Abund uh, uh, the life God created you to have. When God, uh, think about it this way. It's like uh, God, God comes to a world that's living in death and just waves some smelling salts <laughs> under, our, under our nose. That we might spring to life. That we might just be awakened to the reality of who God is and how much he loves us. And how close, how close he is and how, how close eternity is. And sometimes that's to be awakened for the first time to the truth of the good news of Jesus. And for some of us, it's leaning into this story again. And that'll be a big part of our journey through John. Just to come back to it, just to be reminded, to be re, reawakened, revived to, to the truth of the glory of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And that's the impact of John's gospel. Here's another thing about why we're in the Gospel of John for the next several months. And I'll, I'll share some of these. Jimmy will share some. Other staff members will touch on some of these sermons. We'll do some of them to team teach some of them. About a year ago, a little over a year ago, we started a journey together as a church. It's taken us down some, down some paths that we just never would have imagined uh, a couple of years ago. 
And part of that idea was, could anything greater happen in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our county, than for a whole lot of people to get to know Jesus? To hear the gospel, the good news of Christ, and their lives be transformed. Could anything better happen to make this a, just a really special place in the walls and outside the walls to the glory of God? Well, we can get outside the walls and do a lot of good things, and we do a lot of good things outside the walls to care for people, to help people, to be uh, light in the darkness. But the purpose for which we exist as a church is not just, wow, those are nice people doing nice things down there at FBC Allen. The reason we exist is that we want to go that they might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing they might have life in His name. Because there's some folks desperate for that good news. So these two verses that are read, verse 30, verse 31, they conclude John's gospel. And chapter 21 is really more of an appendix, a PS to the story. So here we are at the end of the core of this book called John's Gospel. And I just pictured John, he's an older guy, and he's, he's going to live, live a while longer, but he's, he's pretty advanced in age for his time especially. And I think he finishes with that story of Thomas. That's a great way to land this thing, because it started out, Jesus is God, I'm going to finish, Jesus is God, all bracketed up in a great way, and just pushes back from the desk, puts down his pen, and I think that there has to be some reflection on this. All the stories, all the things he has seen, he's experienced with Christ, walking with him, living for him. And some things bring tears to his eyes and some things just make his pulse go a little faster. And I think he leans forward again, maybe thumbs through. Uh, what he's written, reviews it. Am I missing anything? Is there something else that needs to be here? And then he thinks about the people who are going to read this, that it'll go out to all over, believers, unbelievers, who will see this gospel, good news according to John. And, and he pulls up the chair and he leans forward again and he begins to write. And that's what verses 30 and 31, I think, are meant to do. Now, here's what John's gospel does not accomplish for us. It doesn't tell us everything. It's not a structured biography of Jesus. It's not written to satisfy our curiosity. It really doesn't describe Jesus. We don't get the, the clear, well, you know, golden blonde hair, uh, sparkling blue eyes, uh, white robe. Blue sash, you know, all the Jesus pictures, all the Jesus movies, surely that's how it looked. We don't get that. We don't know what his favorite color was, what his favorite food was. We didn't know. Uh, we, we, there are a lot of things about Jesus we don't know that don't get answered that we are always curious about. But John had a purpose, and he stuck to his purpose. And the purpose uh, we find uh, demonstrated in the signs assigned to Jesus now, Jesus did many other signs, did many other miracles, did many other miraculous things, displays of what only Jesus can do. This last week, I was working on a sermon for uh, April 29th, last Sunday this month, from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the story of Jesus in Cana. He goes to a wedding. The wine is run out. Mary says, hey, you got to do something about this. And he turns water into wine. And in that story, there are all kinds of points of application. That Remember, Mary says, well, she says to the servants, whatever he says to servants, whatever he says to do, do it. Well, that's a pretty good rule for everything. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do that. But that's not really how John is structured. John is not a book where you read it, you say, and here are five things to make your marriage better. And here are four things to improve your prayer life. That's not how John is structured because John has such a specific purpose. And you'll find those points of application and we'll make note of those. But the core of it, why did Jesus do what he did at Cana? 
turning water into wine, that the disciples would believe. He had his first core group of disciples. They just started following him, and they needed something they could latch on to. They needed something that pointed beyond just Jesus is a great guy who does good things. They need to see the miraculous and the signs and wonders in Scripture point to the glory of God and the truth of what is being taught. It gave validity to the things Jesus would teach. When Jesus does those things, he doesn't do them as stunts. He doesn't do them as publicity pieces. Uh, there are people who said, hey, do a trick for us and then we'll believe. Jesus didn't do it on demand. He did it when it met his, the purpose of carrying forward the message, the truth, and of his, truth of his message, truth of his identity. There are seven miracle signs during Jesus' public ministry, and we'll touch on several of these as we make our way through John's gospel. Changing water into wine, he healed the son of an officer of the court, healed a man uh, lame, the Beth of, uh, pool of Bethesda, fed 5,000, walked on the Sea of Galilee, healed a man born blind, raised Lazarus from the dead. And those signs, strategically chosen by John, out of everything Jesus did, he said, this isn't all he did, but these things really demonstrate the core things of who Jesus was. So our Lord's teachings are wonderful, and his miraculous signs are evidence, declarations of the truth. The reason you can trust, you can believe in what he taught, because of the things he did. And we need primarily instructions about believing, not about what we ought to do. Uh, because that's all based on us. And the only way you get saved is not by what's based on you. It's based on what Jesus did. And that's how John has structured this. Not so that you can understand, but so that you can believe. So that this becomes a part of who you are. This dives into the depths of your heart. This is the truth of God. And, and it is clear picture. This is Jesus and that is enough. These things are written that you may believe. And you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, those are the two important things that we need to know about Jesus. He says you believe not anything about Jesus. This also touches from last week. I run into people all the time. I'm having these con spiritual conversations with people. Yes, I, I believe in Jesus. Tell me about the Jesus you believe in. Because you're going to have to get a definition on that because everybody's got an imaginary Jesus out there. There are a lot of people with some sort of made up fictional Jesus. Jesus that works for me. Jesus that's my, my good luck charm. Jesus that is my buddy when I need a buddy. The Jesus in the Bible. He has definition. He's not anything you want him to be, anything that we want to frame it to be. Jesus is defined. He is the Christ, the Son of God. And if you're going to believe in him, it's not, I believe, I believe in him. Tell me what you believe. Well, I believe he's a wonderful teacher. He's a fine moral example. He's a good religious leader. No, you believe that he, you need to come to a spot of believing he is the Christ, the Son of God, God in a body on this earth. Now, you throw that out there, and I know that's a heavily theological something. You go, well, that's not much fun. I want it to be more fun than that. Uh, I've, I've had conversations with people are always approaching us, different ministries and churches, from a variety of backgrounds, and then they'll say, hey, let's do this together. And, you know, we'll just do stuff. It doesn't matter what you believe. And we don't want to get all bogged down a bunch of doctrine. Tell you what, I'm not giving up doctrine for anybody. I'm not giving up God's truth. God's truth is an unchanging truth. And so that, that kind of makes a difference in who we, part, who we hold hands with, who we partner up with, who's from God, who's not from God. All those things come to bear when we start talking about the gospel. It matters what we believe. Some people say, well, it doesn't matter what we believe because you just ought to love one another. Well, you ought to love one another. But the reason we love one another is because of what we believe about Jesus. That's why we love one another. Uh, also, I know people who say, I'm a Christian. And, I, and they can actually run down the list of all the beliefs, all the doctrinal stuff. Got it, got it, got it, check, 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 check. Believe all the right things. But they're kind of jerks to hang out with. Because maybe belief is still just a, 
understanding of truth, a knowledge base. We wrestle with that all the time. We're a knowledge-based people in uh, this country and a lot of Christianity in this country. It's all knowledge-based instead of obedience and gospel-based. So we're moving as a church to get the obedience and the gospel part of that back where it needs to be. So it's not just learning more stuff and learning more stuff and never doing anything with it that changes our lives. It ought to be transformational if it's coming from God. There needs to be some surrender involved. There's a lot in John's gospel about believing. Uh, so I'm doing multiple reads through John's gospel. And, I want to, and I'll send out our Monday email tomorrow and it, it has a challenge in there for you. Read John's gospel. Uh, with a highlighter. Highlight it every time it says believe. Read it over and over. Read it multiple times. Dig in with me. And I've been doing this almost a hundred times. Some believe or believing shows up in John's gospel. Over and over and over again. It's, it's not hard to catch what John is trying to accomplish when you start reading this book. And what do you believe? You believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He wants to persuade you in those two core doctrines. So what are those two things? First... Jesus is the Christ. That means he's the Messiah. He's the promised one of God. He's the one the prophets were pointing toward all those years. He's the one that makes wars to cease. He is the one who can prepare the damage of our sin. He's the one who brings justice to the nations. He's the one who can make all things new again. He's the one who will defeat Satan. And we're not going to get any of those things done. There's only one who does that. It is the promised one of God, the Christ, the Messiah. He's appointed Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 61 to bring good news to the poor. He'll bind up the brokenhearted. He'll proclaim liberty to the captives. And that's Jesus. So what do you believe? Well, you can claim a Christian gospel. Jesus is the one who came to rescue this world by his death on the cross to pay for our sins. He was placed in a tomb, and three days later, he was raised from the dead, victorious over sin, death, and hell. He is alive today, and he has opened up new life to all of us, and eternal life through his work, Messiah. And he is the Son of God. As Messiah, he is man. As Son, he is God. John, our author, was a Jewish man. And if someone... If someone claimed deity, someone said, I'm a God, self-deification, uh, John would have thrown a fit. There would have been a lot of pushback. That was, a, that was a no way do you do this. But Jesus declared it, and John watched him declare it, heard him declare it multiple times. And John embraces him because he saw him back it up. He saw the life that he lived. He saw the miracles he performed. Seven times Jesus made his famous I am statements. We'll touch on several of these. I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheepfold, the, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. Every Jewish person who heard Jesus say I am and put one of those things behind it knew he's claiming to be God. Sometimes we have that conversation, and I see it in uh, blogs and different things I read. Jesus never claimed to be God. The only way you get there is you don't read the Gospel of John. Because that I am statement, that was Jesus grabbing hold of the covenant name for God. Remember when God's speaking to Moses from the burning bush? I am. Tell them I am sent you. That covenant name for God Jesus is claiming it for himself. And he doesn't just do it once. He does it over and over and over again. And every person that heard him would have known he is claiming to be God. We've already seen Thomas calling Jesus my Lord and my God. And he received, he received worship. Jesus accepted that declaration. He didn't push him back. Hey, no, wait a minute. That's too much. He received it. And doubting Thomas finally believed. Jesus is God in believing he had life in his name. And how did it come? Because he believed, believing. It wasn't by doing. It wasn't by works. It wasn't by deserving. It was by believing. And it's the same for us. And if you will believe, not just anything about Jesus, but believe, 
Believe he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Life in his name is for you. I want to tell you a story, and this is actually a true story. Sometimes I tell you crazy stories. This is a true story. So brace yourself for truth. You ready? In, uh, on uh, January the 16th, 2014, January the 16th, 2014, New York Times had an article about a guy in Japan who died. He was 91 years old. Here's why the New York Times had a big article about this guy who died in Japan, 91 years old. In late 1944, Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant Hiru Onada of the Japanese Army was sent to an island in the Philippines. He was ordered to defend it against the American advance. 1944. He was told to keep that up until he was told not to. And they left him there. And the Americans came a couple of months later, and they just touched base, kind of touchstone. There wasn't a whole lot there to be had, and they moved on. But, but this officer, Hiru Onada, he fought on. Nobody told him six months later that the war ended. He continued to fight on his little island to defend it, to represent his army, the army of Japan. Well, he, he would steal food from local villages. He'd shoot at somebody every, every now and then, continuing the fight. Uh, and a major irritant to the poor folks of this uh, island in the Philippines. There was a big interview post all of this, and so they got more details from it, about it from him. About 10 years into this, he said he found a newspaper article about him that uh, uh, he figured it was just a trick to try to get him to surrender. This, this is now we're in the mid-50s when this comes along. Uh, he continues on. The Philippine authorities dropped leaflets into his area with letters and photographs from his family asking him to come out of the jungle. They brought live speakers. They figured out about where he was. They'd blast into the jungle with these live spe the, the loudspeakers Hey, you got to come out. The war is over. It's, it's done. Come, just come on out of... Well, he, he didn't believe any of that. They brought his brother in. Put him on the loudspeaker. He said, I heard him. And I knew it was my brother. But I thought he'd just been forced to do it. It was another propaganda move. He refused to believe. He kept on fighting until 1974. 1974. A war that was ended in 1945. He kept fighting until 1974 when uh, the Japanese government finally just got his old commanding officer, put him in a uniform, and sent him into the jungle. you got to find this guy and make him stop. You have to order him to stop. And he went out into the jungle, and they were broadcasting, you know, he's coming, don't shoot him. And he went out, found him, ordered Onada to surrender, and he finally gave up. This man thought he was living in a world at war, and his mind was trapped in 1945, and he shut out this good news of peace, and he lost 30 years of his life in the jungles of the Philippines. Now, there are a whole lot of people like him today, and in their minds, they're trapped in a war that has been over for a very long time. In his death and resurrection, Jesus went up against all evil, sin, death, and hell, and he won. And the future of the world is his. And for 2,000 years now, here's what God's been doing. He's been dropping leaflets and broadcasting big. The war's over. And, and Jesus has won. And it's all settled. And all you have to do is come out of the jungle of your disbelief and your self-sufficiency. All you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believing, you'll finally live the life he created you to live in the first place. And what are you waiting for? Today's a great day to say yes to Jesus. Today's a great day. To say, I have, 
I've been busy and around the edges of this story my whole life. But today, I'm stepping across the line, and I'm not just going to know it. Yeah, I know about Jesus. You know, down on the cross, raised from the dead. I'm going to believe. I'm, I'm going to surrender my life to this. I'm going to lean into this with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, all my strength. I'm going to follow him for the rest of my days. Today's a great day to say yes to Jesus. If you have never made that commitment, I want to encourage you in it. And maybe you, you step out from where you are here in just a moment in our commitment time. And you, you meet me, take my hand and say, Chad, today I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe uh, we talk about it after the worship hour at the Connection Center. We set up a time to visit more because you have a lot of questions. It's a big decision. And you, want to, you want to get it right. And uh, we'll set up a time to visit this week, this afternoon, tonight. Because we're always available. Our, our church ministry uh, leadership always available for that conversation. But why not? Why not step out of the jungle of uh, confusion and effort and struggle and hurt and just give Jesus your yes.